Mike mentioned the Asbury brothers a while ago needing prayer. And I just think it's fitting to say what a blessing they were to me several years ago. Our, our old bus was sick and God didn't heal it. But the Asbury brothers were the doctors that, uh, that treated it. Uh, and uh, if you have a big vehicle like that, anything you do to a car for the same thing on a bus, you can add about two more zeros onto the number. But they were a real blessing to me. And you know what? When people like that need prayer, we need to return the favor and, and pray for them and give honor where honor is due. And that's just what I'm doing. Page 337. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I proved him more and Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. How sweet it is to trust in Jesus. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple slaves to plunge in neath the heat. Cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus. Just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You go right ahead. Amen. 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 That's right. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Go right ahead, huh?
Amen. Thank the Lord. Good. That's good. I wait. I listen. I love the I love the testimonies of the saints. Man, that encourages me. I appreciate it. We're turning your Bibles to First John chapter three. We're going to study a little bit more this evening. I know that I've kind of belabored the First John study, but I think uh, I, I hope you've been. If you've not been taking notes, I hope you've got good memories. Uh, because I don't do this just to have something to do. I'm doing it because I think it's really good for our church, and honestly, it draws us closer to the Lord. And if that's why we're here, amen? And uh, if we just go through a bunch of services and we don't get anything out of it, it does no good. I want you to be able to use what we're using. We're giving you instruments to be able to go out and use it for God's glory. That's what the whole purpose is, okay? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now, I know I've belabored that, go back, I know I've belabored that just a little bit uh, the last week and talking about the sons of God, but the sons of God goes with two things. There's one thing, two things that I want you to think about. First of all, what an honor. What an honor it is that God himself, the creator of everything, said, you are my sons. And, by the way, daughters too. It doesn't mean one or the other. It's just the way they wrote it, but it's forever. You are my sons and daughters. To me, that, that is the most amazing title that I will ever wear. The sons and daughters of God. Now, that means you are blessed. That means you have privileges that other people don't have. Listen, that means you sit in a, a place where other people aren't. Not because they're not special, because they haven't accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, when you come into the kingdom of God, you become under his reign. And he is a king, you're in his kingdom. That means he protects you, he provides for you, he blesses you, he helps you, he heals you, he gives you what you need, he gives you what you don't need, just because he wants to spoil you a little bit, like you spoil your kids. He just wants to love you, and he wants you to love him. And you are the sons and daughters of God. That is an amazing title that we need to wear boldly and proudly, not because we have done anything, because he's done everything. Amen. It's not because we have accomplished anything. It's because Christ accomplished it on the cross. And so you are the sons and daughters of God. And listen, if you're not saved here tonight, and I, I don't pretend to know everybody's heart. I'm not your judge. I'll tell you that a million times. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm just a messenger from God. But if you're not saved here tonight, then you need to get saved. Why? If no other reason to be the son and a daughter of God. That is a, it's a privilege and an honor. And as I use my daughter, Natalie, she's been bowling over. I mean, she has just been bubbling over all the time. She wants to get more involved in church because she got right with God. And she's, she's excited about the things of God. Listen, when you really become a son and a daughter of God and you understand what you just did, let me tell you something. There's, it feels, I did at least, and everybody's a little different. Everybody has a different experience. But I felt like I was floating above the ground almost. It was felt so good. The burden had been lifted. I just felt so light. I didn't have a worry in the world. Oh, I had all kinds of troubles, but it didn't bother me. Because I had a God that I knew was going to take care of those troubles. It's an amazing place. But not only do we have the privileges and the honors and all the things and the blessings of God, but also on the flip side of that, because you have a son and a daughter of God means you have a great accountability and responsibility because you now are a son and daughter of God. And so as a son or a daughter of God, you should be following in the footstep as his son, Jesus Christ, which means we're Christians, right? That's what Christian means. It means Christ-like. So as Christ-like people, we ought to be following his footsteps. What was Jesus' main focus when he was here on earth? Was it to get rich? <laughs> if he did, he was a failure. I mean, honestly, he had to use a borrowed tomb to be buried in. He, he wore sandals, but the, the Bible tells us his sandals never wore out. You know, he wore robes, but that doesn't tell us he had a whole wardrobe of robes. He just said he wore robes. He was covered and, and, and modest. But what his main focus was was not houses or lands or riches or, or even his own health. Or His main focus was to reach the souls of men and women all over the world. 
In fact, he commissioned that same purpose to me and to you. In Matthew, it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing, teaching. Amen? So our, our blessing is that he is blessing us. He is, he's here with us. His presence is real. But also, the accountability part is there's a, there's a life to live because you're a son and daughter. You're no longer what you used to be. You say, well, I can do whatever I want. You can, but you're stepping out of the will of God. You can do whatever you want. You have the choice. I, get, I, get, I really get tired. I'm, I'm not trying to get political. I promise you. I'm not even trying. I don't want to. Uh, but, but, but these people say, well, it's my body. I can do whatever I want. It, I just feel like just saying, who gave you the body? Did you create yourself? Did you form yourself? Did you insert the soul by yourself? You're taking a great honor and privilege that God has blessed you with and abusing it and misusing it for your own glory. So you become God. Now that's okay if you want to do it here. But I'm telling you there's going to be a payday one day for those kind of people. We have got to understand that we're no longer ours, but we're his. I, I love my son dearly. I mean, I love him. Just as much as my two daughters. He and my son, if you don't know, he's adopted. He knows that. He's, he's, he, was, he was chosen by us in our family, right? And he was he's special because my daughters, we, they just happened. My son, he was chosen. Can I tell you something? You have been chosen to be in the family of God. That is awesome, man. I don't care what you get in the world or what you don't have in the world. I'm telling you, if you are chosen by God and put into his family, that is a privilege and honor. You ought to, you ought to be shouting to the rooftop. Amen. You ought to be saying, thank you, Jesus. Why? I'm the son of God. That's, that, uh, if we stop right there and you just let that marinate and sink in a little bit, it'll be enough for this evening, I'm telling you. To realize the honor and the accountability of being a son or daughter of God has got to be something amazing. Amen? Now, he would not tell you to do something you were not able to do. In other words, he would not say, go out and preach the gospel if he didn't think you were capable. You say, well, I can't do that. I, I agree that you probably can't on your own. But if you'll trust God and let God's Spirit work through you, and you'll get in His Word, and you'll pray and seek His face, and get close to God, then He will make you capable where you never was capable before. Yeah. I hear some people say, I'm just not a speaker. I know some people that were never speakers. In fact, I know a few of them that took an F, and, and, and what do you, when you do a speech, they took an F in high school for that, and they're preachers now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you didn't guess, you probably might have, but, but in elementary school, I was in speech. You know, they teach you how to speak. I'm sure they wish they had never done that now, but I speak, was in speech when I was a kid that will teach me how to speak better. Isn't that amazing? And now I do this for a living. I'm telling you, God can take your incapabilities and turn you around and make you something you never could be on your own. That's the beautiful thing about being a God, or a son of God, or a daughter of God. You are God's clay that he's molding and shaping, and if you'll keep your hands off and let him control you, you will be more than you ever was able to be on your own. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad it's that way? Some of you are in, listen, let's face it, you don't have to testify, I already know it, because I was in the same place you were. Some of us was in miserable places in the world. We were miserable on the inside and the miserable on the outside. Some of us try to even put on good faces to make us look good and sound good and, and be nice to people, but really, on the inside, we were destroyed. We were tore up. We were broken. And God took that mess and made a miracle. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he's still working on me and you today. I'm glad he not only made me a son of God, but he's still teaching me how to be a son of God. My son, by the way, I was telling you about my blessed little son. Bless his little heart. I'm sure some days he wishes he was in any other family than ours because I actually make him do things. And he's just, now he's just says, okay, I might as well do it because he knows there's no other choices in the world. 
Sometimes we've got to do what God tells us even though we don't feel like it. There's some days, I'll be honest with you, on Sunday morning, I know you probably don't get this, but on Sunday morning, I don't always feel like preaching a message. I don't feel like it in my body. Some nights, uh, some days, I don't feel like it in my spirit. Some days, I don't feel like it in my head. Some days, I want to put the covers back over my head, just like some of you all do, and say, wake me up next Sunday, let me try it again. <laughs> but I, you know what? It's not my choice to feel like it. I'm not going on my body's feelings. I'm not going on what mind tells me. I'm not going on what I feel that day. I'm going on God appointed me and dedicated me for his service. I need to do his will and not mine. Why? Because I'm a son of God. Amen. I'm a son of God. If my boy's in the bed, I say, son, get up. You've got to go feed the animals. Listen, he says, Dad, I'm not doing it. I don't know how it works in your house. But I actually have never heard those kind of words in my house. I said, because if he were to say that, I would say, I'm sorry, what did you say? I surely didn't hear it right because I know those words would not come out of your mouth. Now, this boy is going to get about 6'2 or so. At least that's what the doctor tell me. That's why I'm trying to get him in line why he is here, where I can handle him. Because when he gets here, I'm going to be looking at him and say, okay, do whatever you want. But I pray by this time that I've matured him into a young man that wants to make the right decisions, do the right things, live the right life, love the people like he's supposed to, because at that time, I've done my job right all the way here. He is going to be the man that God's created him to be rather than what he could have been without somebody instructing him. Amen. You and I think we can do it better on our own, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot. You need Jesus. You need the Spirit of God to develop you, to create you, to mold you, to shape you, so that one day you're going to be mature enough in him to say, that's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. You see, you can't do it on your own. You're not meant to do it on your own. That's why he spent, sent the Spirit of God. That's why he sent his son to the cross to die for you. That's why he gave an example. That's why he gave us the word. That's why he gave us the church. That's why he gives you a pastor. Whether you like it or not, that's why he gave you the pastor. Because he knew we need a lot of other places and a lot of other support to get us where we need to go. If you're left by yourself, you're weak and frail. If you try to pull off, you're weak and frail. That's why the devil's number one ploy to uh, this church is to try to get people to say, well, I just ain't going today. Because he knows if he, can't, if he can get you not going that day, then the next time it's going to be easier to say, well, I'm just a little sick. I'm not feeling well. I'm tired. I've worked hard all week. Amen? Amen. And then the next time, well, you know, I'm busy. There, there, there's something going on. I've got family coming in. I've got this and i got... Listen, if we're not careful, that, that privilege of being a son or a daughter becomes belittled. We're basically saying, God... I'm not doing that. Amen. 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 And I think God looks at us and says, you said what? <laughs> you, you're going to do what? After all that I've done for you, after all that I've provided for you, after all that I've put you through, after all the raising I've brought you to, and you're going to tell me you're not going to do what I asked you to do? I don't know how you take that, but I don't take that very good for my son. And I don't think God takes it very good either. Amen. You remember the verse that we read in 1 John chapter 2? He says, if you love me, keep my... If you love me, obey me. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. That's why it's important, folks, to just get in the church and in the Word. That's why we've got to stick together in this thing. We've got to trust the Lord. Now, I know there's occasions where you can't come to church. In fact, if you're, if you're snotting and sneezing and feverish, you better stay home. Because if you don't stay home, I'm sending you back home. You're not allowed through the doors. Rick, you're on notice. Don't let nobody through. It's snotting and sneezing and got a fever. You, gotta, you close the door and lock it if you have to. Because we don't want you here if you're snotting and sneezing and feverish. Because we've already had enough. We don't need no more, right? 
So then, now I'm just being facetious, but that means there are certain occasions where you're not supposed to be here. You need to be at home in the bed and, 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 or the doctor's office or the hospital or somewhere, not here. But that's not most of the time. Most of the time, when it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I know there's a lot of churches just do Sunday mornings now. Bless their heart, I don't know how they make it. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not being mean. I'm not their judge. They got to do it their way. We'll do it our way. I'm just saying, I don't know how they make it. I, when I miss a Wednesday night service for whatever reason, I, I miss you guys, first of all, and I miss the fellowship, and I miss the power of God that's moving in our services. I want to be here. I don't, you ain't have to make me be here. I want to be here. Why? I'm the son of a God, and I want to do what he tells me. And he says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together so much more as you see the day approaching. That's the word. Amen. I don't know about you, but when Jesus was in the desert and he was sitting there being he was sitting there being tempted by the devil. He started, kept using the word over and over and over. That's the why we've got it in this book. This is your power. This is your power. So behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, listen to this word, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Don't be amazed that the world don't understand you. That's what that means. Don't be shocked when you say, God bless you, and they look like they're mad and they're going to smack you because you say, God bless you. Because I'm telling you, this world is waxing worse and worse and more wicked all the time. Again, that's why we need to be here in the safe haven of God, energizing and, 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 and encouraging one another and trying to get in the Word to learn more, not less. That world out there is trying to destroy you. Not because they're against you, but because the spirit that's dwelling in them is against you. We're not in a flesh and blood warfare. Remember that. We're in a spiritual warfare. And that spiritual warfare wants to rip you apart. And I don't care how, you, how he does it. It don't matter who he uses. He can use your husband, your wife, your kids. I have seen people lose their eternal salvation because their kids want to do stuff, and they, instead, of, instead of doing what God wanted, they chose what the kids wanted. They've allowed their kids. I'm not trying to be mean. Believe me, I promise you, I'm not. But they allow their kids to be their God. You say, that's not right. Well, here's the thing. When you put anything in front of God, that becomes your God. If all you think about is making money, making money, making money, making money. And listen, I'm not against making money. You've got to make enough money to live and to supply for your families and all that kind of stuff. I get that. But if that is your main focus and your only focus and that's what you live for, that has become your God. That's your purpose in life. That's the purpose that you're living for. Amen. Amen. So if your kids become everything and you revolve everything around them, well, we got to do this for the kids. we got to do this for the kids. You know what? Which would be better for your child to be raised and be a superstar baseball player or basketball player, play in the professional, make millions of dollars, and lo lose his soul? Or this child, child never touches a baseball. I'm not against baseball. Please don't misunderstand. My kids played ball all growing up, but they played ball around church. Why? Because they needed church more than basic. Because you know what? After my kids got up to be a, a middle school, high school, they don't play ball no more. How many of your kids is 20, 30 years old, 40 years old? How many of them play ball now professionally? Go ahead and raise your hand. Come on. I want to see it. I want to meet you. Because I didn't know anybody did. So please, please raise your hand. The odds of them going and being professional ball player. And I'm using this as an example. I don't care what it is. Ballerina. I don't care what it is. You got the, you're putting in their mind what's important. Amen? You're telling them this is more important than this. But here's the problem. The world don't know you because you're doing the right things. The world doesn't know you because you are focused on God and they're not. You're a stranger, the Bible says. You're a foreigner. You're a traveler through this land. You're not meant to be attached to this world. The problem is we are 
more attached to this world than we want to admit. I didn't hear you. What did you say? We are more attached to this world than we want to admit. Why? How can I say that? Because that becomes more important than anything God has to do. And if that ha- is, then you're saying, you know what? I appreciate the honor of being called a son of God, but I'm going to step out of that because I want to do my thing. Amen. Amen. And that's a serious, serious place to be. I'm not trying to be mean, I promise you. I'm just telling you the truth. You see, it comes a great honor to be called a son of God, but it also is a great accountability. In other words, your life changes. Your focus changes. Your desires change. Your passions change. Who you are changes. You are a new person. You're saying, when I'm a Christian, I dedicate my heart, soul, mind, and strength to God. Well, I will do that, Pastor. I, I want to do that. that that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Okay, well, great. I'll see you Wednesday night. Well, you know, I'm a little busy on Wednesdays now. Well, okay, how about Sunday? Well, well, Sunday, you know, I'll try to be there. There's a lot of going on in my world. I mean, I'm a busy person, you know. I got a big position, and I, I got, you know, whew, I'm just really tired by Sunday. Oh, okay, okay, okay. How about Sunday night? Was Sunday night? You rested up by Sunday morning? How about Sunday night? Well, I don't know about Sunday night now, you know. Sunday night, we're kind of getting ready for Monday, and Monday's a work day, and and it's hard for me to get up on. But I love Jesus. Don't forget, I love Jesus. He's first in my life. He's he's the first thing in my life. Don't you think second, Pastor, he's the first thing in my life. Oh, okay, I've got you. And listen, as a pastor that loves you, and I'm going to be praying for you, but I don't believe you. I love you. I'm not even calling you a liar. I'm not going to say you're a hypocrite. I'm not going to say, I'm not your judge. Do you remember that? I said that in the beginning. I'm going to say it again. I'm not your judge, but I just tell you right now, I don't believe it. You see, there's a thing called put your money where your mouth is. In other words, what you say ought to be how you live. And if you don't do what you say, then it's called a, well, lie. But what do they call those people? Hypocrites. Now, how many of you like to be called hypocrite? Go ahead and raise your hand real quick. Exactly. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Your neighbor, if I was to ask them, are your, is your neighbor a Christian? And the neighbor is you, by the way. Is your neighbor a Christian? They ought to be saying, absolutely. Man, they're all the time loving people. They're sharing their, their life with people. They're investing themselves in people. I see them go out on Sunday mornings to church, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. I see them all the time at church. They've invited me to church all this time. Amen. That would be a good testimony, wouldn't you think? That would say, hey, I've done good on that one. i passed that test. But if I ask the neighbor, hey, are they Christians? Well, I'm not sure. And I see them. I see the kids playing in the backyard on Sunday morning. They've asked me to go play bingo several times. On Wednesday night, by the way, when church was going on. You know what I mean? We ought to have a testimony. We ought to have a testimony because if we don't have a testimony for the world, what are we? What good are we? The Bible says salt without its flavor or savor or the usefulness of it, it becomes waste. In fact, it's worse than waste because it causes death. If you ever throw salt on the ground, a bunch of salt in one place, the grass don't even grow. Weeds don't even grow because it's too salty. Let me tell you something. I never intend to get into all this, but I don't know why I'm going on this, but I'm here. So I'm telling you right now, as a church of the living God, as sons and daughters of God, we ought to be strange to this world. Because when they're mad, we ought to be happy. When they're aggravated, we ought to be encouraging. When they're sad, you ought to be uplifting. Why is that? Because that's what Jesus did. And you should be following his footsteps. Well, I didn't sign up for all that. Then you better come back and get another dose. Because you got the wrong signer upper. Amen? You you got the wrong, you need it, you and I, we have got to be true. We have got to be life. We have got to be light. We have got to be the salt. 
We cannot play games with this amazing gift that God has given us called salvation. If we do, we're no different than any other religious folks that going down the road said, I'm okay, when they cuss and rant and rave and act like the world, and there's no difference between them and the world. This Bible says they ought to say, who are you? What's, what, why are you different? You ought to be in shambles right now. You ought to be sad right now. You ought to be crying right now. You ought to quit your job right now. That person treated you bad. Why are you still smiling? Amen? They ought to be saying, I don't understand you. And then you've got a great opening, a wide open door. Say, well, let me tell you about Jesus. Because before, I would have tore his head off and never blinked an eye. Now, I'm praying that he gets saved. Golly, man, that's amazing. Isn't that something? It, it would, just imagine if the world acted and walked and talked like that. Imagine if the church would live that every day. You wouldn't have to make people come to church with you. They'd be saying, hey, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I want a little dose of that one right there. Amen. Can I ask you something? You don't answer me, please. Don't answer me. One, do you want to look at good to lie to me or to tell me the truth? Don't help me a bit. You just talk to God right now. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you a son or a daughter of God? Are you saying I'm saved? If you are, there's a great privileges and honors and blessings behind that. But I'm telling you, there's some accountability. There's responsibility. There's decisions you've got to make. There's choices you've got to live. There's a life that's behind that. Are you so familiar with the world that they understand you and you all get along good? Or are they saying, my goodness, I told a great joke. Sure, it had some bad words in it. It was a little off color. But man, it was a good joke, and he didn't even laugh. Amen? Listen, we shouldn't be eating the stuff that they're eating. We shouldn't be drinking the stuff we're drinking. I'm not talking about the little eating. I'm talking about stuff you hear and say. We ought to be doing and living a different life than what they are. Why? You're different. You're no longer your own. You're sons of God. And if God don't want to hear it, you shouldn't want to hear it. If God ain't going to say it, you shouldn't be saying it. If God's going to do it, you ought to be doing it. If Jesus done it, you better be doing it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Welcome to 1 John chapter 3. <laughs> Verse 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. In other words, he's saying that we really don't know what we're going to be. Even, even here, John's saying, we don't know what we're going to look like and be like. But whatever we are, it's going to be like Jesus. Amen? Amen. That, that's really what he said. He said, I don't know what we're going to look like when we're on the other side. But whatever we are going to be, it's going to be like Jesus. Amen. Now, if you remember when Jesus met with Moses and somebody, <laughs> my mind went blank. Elijah, thank you. Moses and Elijah met him on tra Mount Transfiguration. They recognized it was Moses and Elijah, so they recognized him. They didn't just say, wow, I wonder who that is. They actually recognized Moses and Elijah, right? And then they said, hey, we're going to make, we're gonna make something for all three of you to worship. No, no. So we're not going to be somebody else. If we're somebody else, then it's not you. But it, we don't know exactly what it's going to be. But the Bible tells us we're going to have a glorified body. That's enough for me. No more aches, no more pains, no more eye problems, no more ear problems, no more handicapped spaces, no more, no more going to the doctor. Praise the Jesus in heaven. No more going to the doctor. No more, no more needing or wanting. God's going to provide it all. It is going to be wonderful. You don't want to miss it. Amen. That's part of the blessings and the privilege of being a son of God. Go ahead, Nick. Or not. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is exactly what I'm telling you about. If you think, if you believe in Jesus and you have the hope of Jesus in your life, in other words, you've received Jesus, the, 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 the sacrifice that he made, 
You said, I receive that. I'm taking that in. I'm accepting that. Praise God. I'm the Son of God. Then, verse 3 is for you. And every man that hath this hope in him, what hope? That you're going to be going to heaven one day, you're going to have that glorified body, that you're a son of God. He says, then you're going to what? Purify himself. Now, I don't know if you know what that means. I'm sure you do. But we have what we call a purifier at our house for the water because we have well water, which is really good water, but it needs to be purified because you know what's in the water, in the well? Even though it's a good well, it's got rocks and dirt and who knows what else that I don't want to know about. It's all in there, swimming around, critters, whatever you got, it's there, right? And you, some we don't know. But that purifier takes all the impurities out so that when I've turned the faucet on, put it in a glass, it looks like nothing swimming around. It looks like water. It's clear. It's beautiful. It's healthy. It's good. So what he's saying is, you and I ought to purify. We ought to strain our life. David said it this way, Lord, search me. Try me. And if there's any wicked way in me, show me. So I can get it out of me. Because I want to be more like you and less like what I am. Amen? Amen. That ought to be a daily life. A new, the New Testament tells us this way. He says, I die out daily. Die out daily? You mean you shoot yourself every day? It would be kind of hard to do, wouldn't it? No. He means he's dying out to himself daily so that he can live for Christ in a better way. You and I have got to learn to purify our hearts, our minds, our spirits. And as I've told you a thousand times, and I'll tell you one more time, this will be a thousand and one now, if anybody's keeping track, but I'll tell you a thousand and one times, here's the thing. When you put junk in, junk comes out. I don't care how great you are, how restrained you are, how good you are, how powerful, how disciplined you are, I'm telling you, if you keep feeding junk in your head and in your ears and in your, in your spirit, eventually that junk builds up to the point where it's going to come out. And then people say, oh, I slipped. No, no, no. You slipped a long time ago when you started putting that junk in your head. If you just put blessings in you and you put encouragement and you put uplifting music and you put God in you, I'm telling you, when you get mad, guess what comes out? What's already in there? You know what's in there? God, his spirit, his love. Take a hammer, bust your fingers. Blessed be the Lord of the... Listen, we ain't going to be shouting some kind of obscenity. We're going to be saying, thank the Lord. I've got a thumb, but boy, it hurts right now. <laughs> Amen. Man, I've hit my thumb. by putting them big 16 nails in sometimes, you know, and you're going to whap it as hard as I try to get in there too because you are my man. And I'm, I'm going to get in there two times instead of three. And so I whop that thing instead of the wrong nails gets hit. And I'm telling you, I have had it happen. Blood squirts out the end of my finger. I knew you all wanted to know that. That's why I shared it with you. <laughs> At that point in time, I'm telling you, what you find out is who you are. You see, you don't really know who you are when everything's going well. You know who you are when things are not going so good. You're not feeling out how, finding out how you, you, it's, you are right here in church because everybody around you is churchy. We all love each other, at least face to face. We're patting each other out. Oh, I'll just bless you. Of course, we don't know what we say behind, but anyway, we'll get to that later. But anyway, we, we don't know. But listen to me. When we get out there, among friends that's not churchy. How do you act then? How do you talk then? Amen. You and I have got to purify ourselves. Get everything that's unclean. Get everything that's, 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 that's not godly. The Bible says it this way, and I love this verse, and I use it constantly on my own self, and sometimes when I give advice or I'm counseling somebody, I'll say, listen, because they'll say, Pastor, do you think this is wrong? I say, you know what? First of all, if you have to ask, probably need to leave it alone. Because you're looking for a loophole I'm going to give you. But the Bible verse that I like to use in those, particularly those cases is, keep yourself even from the appearance of evil. 
Now, I want you to understand what that verse means, and I've got to hurry up because I'm down out of time. Four minutes, I've got out of time. But here's what that verse means. Even if you don't think it's wrong, and Willa thinks it's wrong, and she's watching me do this, whatever this is, it's evil. You say, that is not right, okay? What's the appearance of evil? If I put a cardboard of me up here, and I go sit down and you look at that, what is that appearing like? It appears like me. It's not me, but it's me. It's a picture of me. And believe me, there's only one of me. Because the world can't handle two of me. So that cardboard is an appearance of me. Doesn't mean it's me, but it's an appearance of me. In other words, just because you say, well, that's not, it don't hurt me. I mean, it's my body, it's my mind, it's my, I can do whatever I want. That's not what the word says. The Bible says keep yourself even from the appearance. And that means if Mike's watching me and I'm doing something that's hurting him or hindering him or a stumbling block to him, then I don't need to do it. I'm telling you, that cuts out a lot of gray area. Your life just revolutionized and changed right then. Let me give you one a little closer to home. Let's say in your home, you're sitting there and you and your wife or husband's having a great discussion over who knows what. And you're getting so angry by the, by the word. Your blood pressure's going up. Your face is turning red. I'm telling you, you're about looking like a blowfish ready to explode. Because you and her or him are going, you're at it, and you're mad, and you're aggravated, and you're ready to just absolutely scream. You say, well, I'm being angry instead of not. <laughs> well, bless your heart, let me ask you this. What if your five-year-old kid's sitting there watching you and how you're acting? What does he think you're appearing like? Now let me switch it a little more. What if he acted like you act? You know what you would do? You would discipline that child because he shouldn't be acting like that. Hello? Yeah. Anybody with me? You better be because I'm telling you the gospel truth right now. What I'm telling you is the Bible. You ought, not, you ought to stay away from anything even appearing evil. You say, that means I can't get mad at my wife. I guarantee you're going to get mad at that woman. I promise you, eventually somebody's going to get mad sometime. It's going to happen. But that Bible verse that says, be angry and sin not, doesn't mean you scream and yell and cut her head off. You know, most times she's mad at you. It's your fault. Do you know that she is your responsibility to make happy? That she, you brought her into your relationship. You said, I do. And you are to protect and provide and love her. Amen. You are supposed to cherish her. My wife says it very plainly and very, I think, great. She says, some days I love you, but I don't like you right now. You've heard me say that, and I'm telling you, it's still true. There are some days she loves me, but she don't like me. Amen. I tell her this great verse. I said, a wife ought to submit herself to her husband. That's not a good verse to use when you're in an argument. Because my wife knows the Bible just about as good as I do, or better maybe. And she says, well, i tell you what I'll do. I'll love you as good as uh, Sarah loved Abraham as long as you treat me like Abraham treated Sarah. <laughs> you don't have nowhere to go on that. I've, looked, I've listened, I've studied for 28 years. I've tried to get a comeback for that, and there's nothing. <laughs> you say, Pastor, you're going off base. Now, here's what I'm saying. The, uh, that same little group of verses goes on to say Christ loved the church that he was willing to die for it. And Christ is like the husband that loves the wife. Because the church is the wife and the, 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 the Jesus is the husband. That means you husbands sometimes need to shut your mouth and listen to your wife. Even if she's wrong, right, or indifferent, it does not matter. It does not help the situation to escalate it. Why should you do that? Because you and I, men especially, are full of pride, and we have got to push that pride down and allow God to stand up. 
We have got to keep our mouth shut even though when it kills me. And listen to me, I'm preaching to me just as much as I am to you. So don't think I'm being higher than now. I'm telling you, I'm thankful my wife's not here. Amen. And she's shouting me down right now. I guarantee she's watching at home in the living room saying, praise the Lord. I pray. I'm glad he finally got it after 28 years. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is not easy, but this is right. Now your house, instead of a war zone, becomes a peace, safe haven for your kids. And then when you treat each other right, look at those kids, and they'll say, when they start dating, that some little boy comes up to your pretty little girl and acts like he's going to try to date that girl and he's not going to open a door for her and she's seen daddy open the door for her, uh, her, her his wife for all these years and he, she, he's seen daddy put himself uh, on the line for his wife and he's seen daddy love her and cherish her and hold her close. Let me tell you something. That little girl said, hold it, Hoss. I know there's a lot better than that because I've seen my daddy too long. I've got a good example and you ain't it. And you're going to say, praise the Lord. It was worth every minute of me keeping my mouth shut now just so my baby don't get messed up with that hairy-legged, snotty-nosed boy that come along and thinks he's good enough for my child. Amen? Amen. I'm not God off track, but here's what he's doing. you are become the sons of God. Last example, and I'm going to close. Could you imagine... In your lifetime, have you ever thought, maybe I've done some things to make God aggravated or ang- Jesus angry? What if Jesus reacted like me and you? What if he got so mad? He said, you big dummy. You heathen. I've tried to raise you. I've showed you. I've put people in your life. I've, tried to, I've died on the cross for you. And you're going to act like that. You are the stupidest child I've ever known. Could you imagine for one second Jesus doing that to anybody? So if he didn't do it, what gives us the right to do it to anyone? In fact, you know the verse very well, as well as I do. Instead of doing that very thing, when they crucified him, when they beat him, when they mocked him, when they tore the back off of him, when he couldn't even be recognized by his own mother, and they made him naked and marched him through the streets, he hung on a cross and he said, Father, kill him! That ain't what he said. Thank God that's not what he said. I'll be honest with you, if it had been me and you, we'd probably said that very thing. If we had the power that Christ had and we could have called t- uh, a legion of angels down, we'd have had them down. They were gone. He didn't do that. He said, Father, forgive them. For they're stupid. And they don't know what they're doing. And I would say amen. Too many times we don't have a clue what we're doing and we think we're the smartest person in the room. Too many times we think we got all the answers and we're dumber than a rock. And we act like children. But we expect our children to be raised different than we're looking and teaching and examining, giving them an example of it. I want to remind you one more time before we close. You are the sons and daughters of God. Amen. Act like it. Talk like it. And I don't know if you like this or not, but argue like it. I just think crazy thoughts of Gene. I just think, could you imagine God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in heaven? And they're bickering and fussing and fighting like we do down here. Well, I told you there wasn't going to be no good. Well, I, I died for them, so I've got to love them anyway. Well, I have to deal with them every day because I've got to live with them. I mean, I gotta, you sent me down there, and I have to be in them now. And you, tra- I mean, you don't have anything to say. I mean, look what I have to deal with every day. I mean, these people are crazy, and I still have to deal with them. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I went through a lot of them with the cross. Could you imagine that kind of crazy conversation going on? But we do that every day. We, do, we, we allow things, petty things to get in our life. We allow people to get under our skin. We allow things, and we lose our focus on why we're here and who we are and what we're supposed to be accomplishing. And God help us all that we get focused on Jesus again. You are the sons and daughters of God. Purify yourselves. Because there's blessings to be had. 
And I don't want anything to even give you a chance of missing it. Amen? Amen. I don't know if you got anything out of this. I know I'm going to get a talking to when I get home. <laughs> Pray for me. Pray for me. But I do believe that honestly, if we'll take some of this and we'll apply it to our lives, to our hearts, we'll allow God to move in us and we'll purify some of this stuff. We'll focus on God and not the world, not the things of this world. I know this sounds basic, but I'm telling you, it'll change us. Souls will be saved. Your family will change. Your love will change. Your relationships will change. God will bless. I'm telling you, there's untold millions, trillions, things that we don't even know yet, storehouses of blessings that God's ready to pour out if we get ourselves ready to receive them. I don't know about you, but I want them. And the older I get, the more I want them. The older I get, the more I want Jesus. Help us, Lord. Will you bow your heads? Father in heaven, you are so good to us. We don't know even why, Lord, sometimes you put up with us. But your grace is surely sufficient. Your love abounds. And Father, we're just thankful that you care about us. God, we have messed up <clears throat> so many times. We've made wrong choices. We've acted like children some days. We've been rebellious, but Lord, you have shown us over and over that you love us, and you really will not leave us nor forsake us. Help us tonight, God, this very moment. Speak to each, every heart that, God, we might draw closer to you and, be, and become more of what you want us to be. We need you, God. Whether we even recognize it, whether we realize it, Lord, we need you now more than ever. And we're asking in the precious name of Jesus that you might speak to our hearts, draw us close to you once again, teach us, Lord, mold us and shape us, and help us to become what will bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. I don't have time to do all the announcements. Please make sure you're here on Sunday morning. Sunday school, 930, church, 1030. Please be here. We'd love you, appreciate you. Yes, Bob. I like to be prayed for. Come on up, brother. Absolutely. Anybody else that needs prayer, needs to be anointed? We believe in the Bible. James tells us a um, that we we'll come together, we'll pray and anoint them, that they can be healed. We can believe in that and have faith in that because Christ bore our healing with the stripes that he bore on his back. All right, Brother Gene, we'll sure do that. Come on up and we'll use this as dismissal prayer. We're going for an EKG tomorrow. All right. And blood test for All surgery right. on I'm Friday. Love you, Brother Gene. My head, I just can't get it. All right. Brother Gene's got head issues, and, and um, his headache is having a real problem, and then Bob is going to be having EKG and different things tomorrow. I ask you to be praying for both of these, okay? Father, in your word we have seen countless numbers of times when you have healed the blind and you've caused the lame to be able to walk. And Lord, the lady with the issue of blood was just a touch of your garment, changed forevermore. She was made whole. Father, we know you're able. You said in your word to ask and we shall receive. And we're asking in the name of Jesus to come down in this very moment and touch these dear brethren. We're asking God that you would just anoint Brother Gene and touch his head and help him to relieve the pain and the agony. Lord, we're asking that you just completely make him well from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Let him feel your power manifested in him right this minute. Lord, let him know you, God, that you've touched him, that you've healed him, that you've given him victory over this, that he might be able to function and praise you and give a great testimony, Lord, of how you've done it one more time. We thank you, Father, what you just did. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We put faith in you. Lord, we're asking that you touch Bob. 
Lord, he's been having some health issues for some time, and we're asking, God, that you just bless him and help him. Encourage your spirit. Let him know that, God, you have got his back, that you're not going to leave him, that, God, you are going to put your arms of love around him, and, God, he will be made whole in Jesus' name. We rebuke anything and everything that was hinder either one of these brethren. In Jesus' name, we claim healing right now. Amen. And we thank you. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. We're so glad to have you this evening. Please, if you would be here Sunday morning, bright and early, bring a bunch of folks with you. Let's just praise and praise and worship and ask the Lord to do a great work. Amen? Amen. God bless you all.